number two, right across from there. For her our prayer shall rise to God above the skies. On him we wait. Thou who art ever nigh, guarding with watchful eye, to thee aloud we cry, God save the day. Then back up to verse number four. Our fathers, God, to thee offer. morning in the uh, message we read from 2 Timothy, and the Bible tells us that in the last days there will be dangerous, hard-to-deal-with times. I was listening to the president uh, this afternoon as he was coming back to the White House, and the question was asked, what about planes unidentified who would uh, not identify themselves uh, flying into a strategic area, what, uh, what will you do? And he said, we have given the order that if they do not respond, if they do not identify themselves, and they continue on to a uh, portion of our country where it's highly populated and buildings and so forth, we've given our military order to shoot them down. Did you ever think we'd hear that in our country? Uh, that's a strange uh, day we're living in, isn't it? But uh, the Bible tells us it's dangerous, hard to deal with. And I'd like to stand here tonight and tell you it'll get better, but I can't, I'm not sure I can tell you that. But I can tell you to have faith in God. And I'm sure of that. That's the one thing that I am sure of. And uh, you, you can't threaten me with heaven. Amen? Uh, if I go home today, that's okay. If we go home today, that's all right. You can't threaten me with heaven. So let's just keep praying. Uh, <clears throat> Gloria Esposito, still in the hospital. Did you get to see her today? Mike didn't get to see her today. Uh, still not found the, uh, the problem and uh, still have some memory lapses and still doing tests. And so keep her in prayer, if you will. Brother Kroll was with us last Sunday evening, is recovering at home. Uh, keep him in prayer, uh, if you will. How many of you have an unspoken request? I certainly do. Many of us. All right. Let's bow.
glad for that peace, I tell you. Don't just sit there. Do something, okay? Now, in our new building, we're going to do the best that we can to put in an air conditioning and heating system that adjusts. If it gets too hot, too cold, adjusts to the best of our ability. Don't talk back to me right now. To the, our ability. But until then, until then, fellas, if you see the ladies getting cold, do something. If you see the men getting too hot, well, just don't worry about it. Uh, anyway, Brother Wayne Edmonds said this morning, he said, Preacher, I just dress for winter and I know I'll be comfortable. So, <laughs> All right. We begin a series of messages tonight from the, the book of 1 Corinthians, and we'll look in chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. And the message tonight to introduce this book, Getting Things Straight. Getting Things Straight. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Getting things straight. Let's bow for prayer <clears throat> and let's ask the Lord to speak to our heart tonight. Father, we've had a good fellowship today on the Lord's Day. The music has been inspiring and beautiful. Our fellowship has been sweet. There's an air of excitement among our people as we wait for what you're going to do. There's also an expectancy and there's also a measure of fear. And Lord, we know that some fear is not wrong. Uh, fear of you is not wrong. And certainly uh, fear causes us to react sometimes in a proper way. And so Lord, help us to have the right kind of fear, but not help us not have the fear that binds and controls and destroys. And in these days, increase our faith and help us to trust in you. Now Father, we begin a series of messages from the book of 1 Corinthians on Sunday evening a church that in many ways is not different from ours. Maybe at a different time and maybe in a different social setting, maybe a certainly a different culture, uh, but yet in so many ways man is the same wherever he is. And in whatever dispensation he finds himself in. And so, Father, there are some tremendous truths here in this passage of Scripture that will help us individually and collectively if we will just allow your precious word to penetrate our heart and our mind. Now, Lord, I ask that you will use us tonight and that you will get glory to yourself and that you will teach your people uh, that which we need. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll give us liberty and I pray that you will speak to our heart. This prayer I ask in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. The theme of 1 Corinthians is be wise, be wise. Paul tells us to how to know the difference between man's knowledge and God's wisdom. Now there's a difference, a big difference in man's knowledge and God's wisdom. I don't know about you, but for my own personal life, I want the wisdom of God. For our church, I feel that we need to have the wisdom of God. Uh, Paul certainly recognized that great need, and certainly this church needed God's wisdom. In A.D. 50, Paul went to Corinth. You read that story in Acts chapter 18. He remained there for 18 months and established this strong church. 
most of the Christians in this church were saved out of paganism. Uh, they did not know anything but idol worship. They came from a very wicked background. Uh, morally, anything goes was the idea. And these Christians were saved out of that. Paul had gone away, and uh, in his going away and ministering in other parts of the world, a letter had come to him from the household of Shiloh. These were some good people in the church at Corinth who was observing what was going on. And they did not like what they were seeing. And so they wrote Paul a letter, and they said, Paul, uh, this church needs your attention. Uh, when you left it, things were going on but now we have a church that is defiled, we have a church that is divided, and we have a church that is disgraced. And you read First and Second Corinthians, you discover uh, some of the things that were happening. And so some questions were asked the Apostle Paul, and he answers <clears throat> those questions. That's what First Corinthians and Second Corinthians really is about. But the main idea that I want to keep before you tonight is this matter of being wise, being wise. Uh, put aside man's knowledge and gain God's wisdom. Now, I learned a long time ago that I would rather have a man in a pair of overhauls who knows God. He may only have an eighth grade education, but he knows God. He's a righteous man, a humble man. He's a holy man, a godly man. I'd rather have him looking over the financial affairs of the church than to have a banker, a financier who is trained in the schools but who doesn't understand the wisdom of God. Put him aside and use the man who's godly. I believe that's godly wisdom. Now, if you find a man who's expert in in finances, but as a holy man and a godly man, obviously use him. But the idea is to be wise. Now, in my everyday life and in your everyday life, we need to be very careful that we use the wisdom of God. Now, what, what is he talking about here in this passage of Scripture when he talks about the matter of being wise? Well, uh, we ought to be wise about our message. The Lord has instilled to us and has... Uh, given to us the message of the gospel, the greatest message that any man could have, the greatest message that any world could have. It is not a message of works. It is not a message of religion. It is a message of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can be saved. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, high or low, uh, educated, uneducated, uh, come from a wicked background or you come from a moral background, uh, you need to be saved. Now, that's the message we need to take to everyone. And we need to be wise about that message. We need to use every means possible to get that message to everyone in North Charleston, to everyone in Charleston, to everyone in South Carolina if we can, to everyone in America, and then throughout the world. We need to be wise in getting this message out to a lost and dying world. Now, I said the last Sunday evening, and let me say again, I'm concerned about whether our carpet's clean or not. I'm concerned about whether the organ and piano plays right. I'm concerned about the platform, whether there's enough room up here. I'm concerned about uh, the appearance of the church. I'm concerned about the outside. Uh, when a person drives up, I want him to immediately uh, see the grounds and see the building and say, my, those people care about God's house. They care. I want a man or a woman to walk into the bathrooms and not be turned aside or turned away. I'm concerned about all of that. But I'm more concerned about our message. I'm concerned that we get it right and that we stand by it and that we get it out to the, to the, to the world. And uh, we need to quit uh, cowering down and being concerned over little picky, insignificant matters and get concerned about giving the message of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. I'm sure glad He saved me. And I'm glad that I'm on my way to heaven. I'm glad some preacher, even though he was an uneducated man, had enough grit about him to stand in the pulpit and preach that you need Jesus. And if you don't have him, you're going to hell. And that touched my heart. And I got saved at an early age. And I thank God for that. And when I get to heaven, I'll grab that old preacher around the neck and tell him, I thank God that he told me about the Lord Jesus. 
and I wasn't raised in an ungodly home, and I was saved from a lot of those things, and I thank God for that. And there are little boys and girls out here that need to hear the same thing. And there are teenagers that need to hear the same thing. And we need to be concerned about our message. Now, you can have a message and have it right, but you see, you've got to have a broken heart as you give the message. And there's got to be tears. Look, this is not your church or my church. It's not your bus ministry or my bus ministry. It's not our teen department or your... It's His. It's His. It belongs to Him. And uh, we need to remember that and make sure the power of God is upon us when we go out and when we serve Him uh, in this place. Get the message right. I'm concerned about that. I want to be wise about our message. I want to be wise about the order of our service, the order of our worship. And when you read 1 Corinthians, you get the idea that Paul believed when you come together to worship God that things should be done in order. Now, you go to a lot of services and there's chaos. Now, the Holy Spirit's never out of order, but the Holy Spirit will never do anything apart from the Word of God, from what the Word of God teaches. And the Holy Spirit will never lead you apart from the teachings of the Word of God. Now, that's why we have an order here uh, in our services. That's why I believe in starting on time, and that's why I believe in knowing where we're going and what we're doing. Now, there are times the Spirit of God will lead us to maybe deviate a little bit. And sometimes I'll do that. Sometimes I'll just give people a chance to give a word of testimony or call on someone or change just a little bit. And if the Spirit of God's leading in that, there's nothing wrong with that. But there's an order. There's a way that things should be done. One of the problems that the Corinthian church was facing was this. And by the way, let me say this. Jesus Christ did more to set people free than anyone. The poor, Jesus came for the poor. And he came for the slaves. Uh, you look at it. It's Jesus Christ who sets the, has set the slaves free. And he's done more for women than any other man in history. But one of the things that were ha was happening in the Corinthian church was this. Women who had now been set free by the grace of God were speaking out in the service and were taking authority when they should not. And so Paul writes them back and says, this is not right. And he gave them an order and a way that they're to handle things. That has not changed. That has not changed. My Bible is still as true today, and it has not changed. And uh, I had someone to call me. I had a woman to call me on the phone, and she wanted me to examine their Bible school in this area. And I said, who's your president? And she named a, named a lady that was the president. I said, I think we'll have some problems. And she said, well, why? And I said, because the Bible says a woman is not to assert the authority over the man. Now, I didn't write that. God did. And I don't apologize for that. I, I just don't apologize. I'm not going to turn from my Bible beliefs. And she said to me, here's what she said. But preacher, she said, you don't understand. Society has changed. Well, God hadn't changed. And the Word hadn't changed. And as long as I'm pastor here, we're going to stay by the Word of God. And we're going to do our best to see that in our worship services there's order, order that will bring glory to God. And the order that will, will enhance our ministry uh, the best that we can. And then in this passage of Scripture, the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, talking about the matter of being wise, not only about the matter of our message and to be wise about the matter of our worship, but he also talks about how to discover our spiritual gifts and to develop them and to be wise in that. Now, I'm, I'm so concerned with that. I'm glad that Brother Powell has been dealing with that in his Sunday school class, and I'm glad that Brother Charlie has dealt with that in his class, and we need to deal with that. Listen, every man and woman in this building tonight, everyone here tonight has at least one spiritual gift, at least one. Now, that spiritual gift is not for you. It is for others in this church. Now, you may have more than one spiritual gift, but those gifts are not for you. Those gifts are for others in this church. Oh, what a church we would have if every member knew their spiritual gift or knew their spiritual gifts, plural, and then develop those spiritual gifts and use them for the glory of God. Now, usually, usually, your spiritual gifts will be easy to detect because they'll match your personality. Uh, they'll match your way of, of living. Uh, God usually doesn't deviate uh, from that. And your spiritual gifts will be in line and in proportion with the things that you enjoy doing. 
God, God didn't call you to a, a, a ministry of misery. God didn't call you to a ministry, oh, I know it's what God called me to do, but it's so hard. And I have difficulty doing it and performing it. Oh, I just do the best I can. All baloney. Uh, your spiritual gift will be in proportion to things you enjoy and things that God has prepared you for, and you'll enjoy it. Uh, some other brother in the church or sister in the church might see it before you do. Many times I've seen a young man of whom I knew was called to preach, and I knew it before he did. And sometimes they'll see that. Then there will be a public recognition of that gift. And then there will be the public blessing of God upon that gift. And what am I saying tonight? I'm just say, simply saying that these uh, Christians in, in Corinth, Paul wanted them to discover their spiritual gift, develop their spiritual gift for the benefit of the church and for the glory of God. Then uh, this book is also written to help us to be wise uh, concerning our per personal life, uh, that we might live a clean life, and so that we might escape the pollutions of this world. What a filthy world we live in. What an awful, dirty world we live in. Uh, last night, uh, I was getting ready to go to bed, and, and my wife was all, already in bed. And so I went in, laid down in the bed, and as soon as I laid down, she got up and went to the front room. Now, I know why. No, she wasn't mad at me. There was just something on the 19... 01 black and white channel that she wanted to see and she knew I wouldn't watch it and so she left and uh, so I, I so I, w I was really di really hurt I said <laughs> and uh, picked up the selector and I and, and as, as all of us men do we click 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 you know and I do that that's one of my favorite pastimes football golf and click 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 you know now uh, we don't have HBO, okay? So don't go out here saying the preacher has, H we don't have that. We don't have the MTV. Uh, we don't have that. We do have the Tennessee Orange Channel. Yes, we have that. But we don't have HBO. But as I was going up the dial, you know how it is? I don't know how it is on your TV, but every once in a while when you click on a channel, it'll come on real quick and go off. And what I saw, I couldn't believe. That's all I'm going to say. What I saw, I couldn't believe. I don't want HBO. This is a filthy world. Now, think with me for a moment. A man who has problem with liquor ought to stay away from liquor. And a man who has a problem with smoking ought to stay away from the pipe shop or whatever it is. And uh, yeah, I give up those cigars a long time ago. But anyway, a man that's got a problem with lust ought to stay away from those kind of things. Amen? And so it's a filthy world. So we want to stay clean. So Paul says, be wise about your personal life, live clean, escape the pollutions of the world, escape it, stay uh, away from it, keep yourself clean. Look at verse 8. Who, will, or who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless? Now the word blameless here means unaccused. Unaccused. Now uh, finish the verse. Watch it now. So that you may be blameless, unaccused in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a day that every one of us will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Now there will be some believers who will be there and they will be saved. But there will be some things that the fire of the Word of God will reveal and somehow, some way, our Savior will say you're guilty. There will be Loss of rewards because of that. So we don't want to live so that we'll be accused. We want to live blameless. We don't want to be accused. We'd like to hear the Lord say, well done. Now you weren't perfect, but there was nothing in your life Satan could take hold of. Over a long stretch, over a long haul, over a, a long period of time, there was nothing Satan could take hold of. And you stand before the judgment seat of Christ unaccused now in verses 1 through 3 you see Paul's greeting to the church he thanked God for them he wanted to uh, stabilize them and watch what he says in verse 1 Paul called to be an apostle 
of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Some had said Paul is not truly an apostle. And you would understand why they might say that, uh, because a disciple had to be one who had seen the risen Lord. And so some were saying Paul didn't see the risen, but he did, didn't he? And they were saying that. So he writes to them in, in his greeting. He wants them to understand the one that is speaking to you is speaking with authority. Now let me just pause here and say something. Make sure, and, I, and of course all of us are priests under the Lord. Every one of us are priests under the Lord. But there's a calling that men have. And that calling from God gives them certain authority. Let me illustrate. Not just anyone in this church can lead in the Lord's Supper. That has to be an ordained man. Not just anyone can baptize. Not just anyone can pastor the church. That has to be a called man. Who gives him his authority? God does. It's in the will of God. He has set them apart for that kind of thing. Now, I'm in, in, and I know that I may stand judged by some uh, in this matter improperly, but I'm, I, I'm going to say the thing uh, anyway. Uh, there are some good men who teach on finances. There are some good men who teach on marriage. There are some good men that you can go to for counseling. But they are not pastors. They do not have the gift of the pastor. They do not have the gift of the pastor teacher. And so be very careful and make sure that the person you're listening to is God called and has the authority to say, God called me. And that will be seen, of course, it will be evident by his life and by what he preaches. And so he gives a greeting here. In verses 4 through 7, you notice Paul's confidence in the church. He was not willing to let the church go. Uh, he wasn't going to give up on the church. Look at verse 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you by Jesus Christ, that in everything that you are enriched. And the word enriched there really means make wealthy. Make wealthy. Now that doesn't necessarily mean finances or monetary things it, it, although it entails that but it primarily means rich in the things of God and that's my goal to be rich and to be wealthy in the things of God and that ought to be my goal as a pastor to see that the church is wealthy in the spirit in the things of God and the only way that comes about is through the word of God and prayer and living for the Lord now let me pause and say this <clears throat> my responsibility is to preach the truth. But I can't make you accept it. And I can't make you listen to it. And I can't make you appropriate it, appropriate it. Only you can do that. But once I deliver the message, and if I deliver it right and correctly and it's from God, then my responsibility ends right there and your responsibility begins. And then the congregation answers to God for how they listen to God's man that he's placed in that church, in that location. Can I insert something here that I think will help? It's always amazed me that God will call a man, train him, and after years of pastoring and after years of looking after the, the flock of God, two or three men or two or three women who've never had that kind of training think they know more than a preacher does. They know better how to run the church. They know better how to pastor than the pastor does. Now, it's, it's obvious that if he's God's man, follow him. Now, if he's not, get rid of him, get somebody else. But if he's God's man, then, then, then follow him. And uh, God's man should want to help the church be enriched in the things of God. And that, that is my goal for this church. Now, we've seen some tremendous changes. We've seen some good things in our church down through these years. But I believe we've just touched the hem of the garment. I believe there's much more in store for the child of God. Now, back to verse 5. That in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind. The word come behind there 
is to fall short. Now watch what he said. You don't fall short in any spiritual gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This church didn't fall short in any spiritual gift. They had all the spiritual gifts, but they were the most carnal. Isn't that amazing? Now, you listen today at preachers on television, and they talk about spiritual gifts. They talk about charisma. And to hear them tell it, that is it. That's utopia. That's the highest level. We are the charismatics. Well, the church at Corinth were charismatics, but they were the most carnal. Isn't that interesting? Think about that for a while. Chew on it for a while. We used to have an old Jersey cow, and uh, the first time I was old enough to remember it, we, I was watching her out in the field chewing her kid. And I said, Daddy, what in the world is she doing? He said, she's eating her food over and over and over and over again. And the cow has two stomachs, and they take it from one to the other, one to the other, one to the other. And I thought, <coughs> But when they get through, it, the food's digested, Amen. And uh, where am I? Where, how'd I get here? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> charismatic. Well, we want to chew the food. We want to do it right, but we want to be used of God. His confidence in this church. But now, look at verse 8, 9, but particularly verse 10. Notice Paul's concern for the church. Look at verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul said, you've got all of these gifts. Now listen, church, don't be divided. The word division here is gap. You know what Paul's saying? Don't let there be a gap in your church. Say the same thing. Have the same goal. You know, the preacher is saying one thing. The leadership is saying the same thing. But around the church, other things are being said. People hear that. Well, I thought the church was going in this direction, but she's saying that over here, and he's saying that over there. That's division. And let me warn you, God has a way of dealing with people who cause division. As a matter of fact, God hates those that stir up trouble among His people. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying if this church is to have the right message, and move forward and be used of God, there can be no divisions, no divisions at all. So Paul says, I want you to be wise. Now that's the introduction, Clint. So because of time, we're going to stop right there, Clint. So I want a hearty amen from you and no problems from you anymore. We'll finish the message next Sunday evening. But let me ask you a question. Are we wise as an individual? Are we wise as a church? Are we wise so that we'll know the knowledge, the difference between the knowledge of the world and the wisdom of God? Would you stand with heads bowed, please? We're standing with heads bowed, eyes are closed. Brother Coker is going to lead us in an invitation. My primary invitation to you tonight is this. Do you want God's wisdom? Do you want God's wisdom for our church, for your family, for you? Do you want to know the difference between the knowledge of man 